in short, uh, we will start with uh, uh, Michael Cote. Uh, he will talk to us about uh, uh, some of the lessons he learned from seven years of running uh, development platforms. So, uh, take it away. Well, hello. I hope you end up uh, uh, enjoying and spent that time applauding afterwards. We'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, well, just to clear up a misnomer, to be honest, I actually haven't run developer platforms for uh, since 2005. I have a philosophy degree, so I don't know how to do math. Uh, so I'm not sure how long ago that is. Sometime. Uh, but uh, what this is going to go over uh, is I have been actually talking with other people and working with them about the platforms that they run for uh, seven, eight, however many years. Seven seems like a fun number, uh, so I picked that. Um, and I just want to go over uh, what they've learned from that, because it is kind of an uh, uh, evergreen and definitely nowadays re-emergent uh, topic. And uh, I think it's fun to, uh, you know, do a little better than last time when, when we reinvent something. But first, let's talk about mayonnaise. And I think we should talk about that other than, you know, regionally where we are, which is fine. Uh, the, it's good, especially uh, as deep down in the stack as we are here, I think to crawl back up the stack and remember why we do it. Now, and by we, again, I only make slides nowadays since 2005, so there really is no the collective we as in people who do computer stuff. Uh, but the reason that we all here, or, uh, or, or y'all, uh, to child-friendly eyes, Adam's phrase there, uh, the reason that we pay attention to this infrastructure stuff, this configuration, ultimately, I believe, having been an application developer, is to support applications, software, or as I like to think of it as my friend uh, Robert Brook over there uh, across the channel in England likes to call it, moving pixels on the screen. Uh, you know, it's something I think that we all appreciate using software in our lives, and the better the software is, generally the better our lives go, or I guess you could think of the better the software is, the worse our lives go, but then I'm not sure if that's a good definition of better. Again, I had a philosophy degree, so we can talk about that afterwards, what better is. But back to the mayonnaise. Now, this is an example of some software developers, and I would say it's representative of the ideal way that they're operating. Uh, and this is not the software developer here. This person develops food, uh, probably delicious, delicious looking pasta. And you can tell that he's a professional because his hat is huge. Uh, this big brain up there is probably processing all sorts of stuff, or perhaps there's a rat controlling what he's doing. We're not sure. But this is a case where there was a company, a food services company, which means they not only deliver food to a cafeteria, but if you want to, they will actually run your corporate or your campus kitchen. You can think of them as outsourcers, uh, gastronomic outsourcers, who will do things for you. And being like all companies, most companies are interested in two things, if they're, uh, mm, I don't know, money-oriented. And that is, they want to have a better customer experience, which is to say they want to attract and retain customers and have a good delivery of something. And they would like to make more money, uh, both at the top line, the revenue, uh, but also more importantly, uh, depending on the type of company, the bottom line, the profit. Which means, uh, to use a term uh, we see a lot in our world, they want people to be more productive, more op optimized, they want to waste less money, right? They want to do more and uh, have more money left over. So of course, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, one of the things, as Adam went over, we were bashing our heads against digital transformation. The way this company was going to solve this problem uh, as, as you can guess, this is several years ago, is that they need tablets, iPads. They need to move their, uh, their recipes from, I would imagine there were three ring binders. It's an American company, so it's three ring binders, not those weird ones uh, we have over here with like six clips in them or something. I'm not sure what happened. Maybe the Marshall program didn't bring over three ring binders. I, I don't know. But, you know, it's a three ring binder thing, it's all paper, these things can distribute it out, people make notes, they, uh, they spill some soup on it or whatever. It's inefficient. And then also people don't follow it as well, you can't update it. So of course, to have better customer experience, more consistent taste and flavor, that the centralized people in the, uh, you know, the chef center of excellence have been pumping out. Uh, and also to make sure that people uh, are efficiently using the, uh, the ingredients that they have, again, meeting those two business goals. Uh, they're going to move the recipes to tablets. Now, this is where the story, I mean, if you're into this kind of thing, gets interesting. So the development team, the software developers, they decided, uh, in true uh, sort of software developer fashion, they were like, that sounds great, how about I just take that and put it in the trash, as far as an idea. And instead, what I'm going to do, they were probably much more pleasant than that, 
But instead, because they were sort of following what I would call the, the best way to do development, they were following more of uh, whatever we want to call it nowadays, user-centric design, uh, I don't know, lean startup approach, or just going and paying attention to what actually helps out uh, is, is probably a more complicated way of putting it. So what they did, if you can imagine this, uh, without having been paged uh, and kind of wasted it out of their mind, like we saw earlier, to go fix something and yell that, uh, they got up at 4 a.m. and uh, they would go to the kitchen uh, for a, a week or so, and they would sort of observe what the people were doing in the kitchen. They would go and study the people who were using their software and see what they were up to, what problems they had, what jobs they were doing, what bottlenecks, a concept we'll return to later. And what they found is that more so than the uh, three ring binder recipes being weird and messed up, that the people in the kitchen were spending a lot of time going around with an analog thermometer and measuring mayonnaise and measuring the temperature of chicken, measuring the temperature of raw ingredients because they had some governance, some compliance they had to follow, which was you have to maintain the proper temperature for the mayonnaise and the chicken, and you have to log it because a health inspector is going to come. And also, you know, more so than just audits, uh, if you actually do have some bad food, you're going to have the ultimate bad customer experience, which is spending the day in the bathroom, right? So you want to make sure you maintain this customer experience. So that was something that they spent a lot of time on, toil, you could call it. And so instead, what the software developers did is they theorized that they found an issue, they found this problem that they could solve, and they, uh, if you'll forgive the phrase, they digitized measuring the mayonnaise. Uh, you know, they, they kind of explored some ideas of doing that and what would work best, but importantly, they measured that that actually improved things, that it removed toil. And sure enough, I, I probably wouldn't be telling you this story uh, if, if it didn't have a happy ending, because what would be the point? Uh, but sure enough, they freed up the kitchen staff's time, and they allowed them to have more productivity, right, to spend time on other things. It also made it easier to pass health inspection stuff. There's a lot of analogs here to how we manage infrastructure, which every now and then I think of, but I never really... Uh, Think to incorporate into the presentation, so I am now. But they freed that time up, and then that was a huge sort of uh, win, if you will, for the development team. Now, they all went on to digitize the recipe books and all sorts of other things like that. But the point is that if you think about that software development team, uh, their ability to have time to focus on discovering the problems iterating through, experimenting with how to fix it, and ultimately improving the flow of the kitchen, the work that was being done there. I don't know, when y'all do whatever it is you do with your, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your DAGs and your YAMLs and things like that, it's for that, right? It's so that we can get productivity in kitchens so that later on at lunch, we can enjoy the lunch that we have and not get food poisoning, right? So I like to start off with uh, measuring the mayonnaise and other things like that. Because one, it's a good representation of kind of pulling down these practices up to the infrastructure layer. But it's good, as we'll get into, to always keep in mind why we're doing what we do. And again, by we, I mean you. Uh, like, what the point of it is and what it is in service of, uh, so to speak. Because it's easy to lose track of that uh, and kind of forget who the customer is, right? Like, who it is you're building this stuff for and, and what the point of it is. So, uh, this is me. As you can see, I was back home in Austin uh, the, the, over Christmas, uh, and I found this award that is very biographical. I don't know if you can read this, but this is the, uh, the Team Innovation Award for FY05, which probably means it was calendar year 2004. And uh, this has since broken, uh, like so many things I did back then. Uh, but that's back when I worked at uh, BMC Software, writing systems management stuff. If you've ever used uh, stuff that I wrote, uh, sorry about that. Uh, hopefully you got uh, some upgrades or some other uh, thing to use in place. But nowadays I work at VMware. I came in there through, uh, through Pivotal, uh, which I, uh, you know, the first year I started at Pivotal, I was here uh, in 2015 with my, my buddy Andrew Schaefer. And uh, if, you, if you remember Bosch, I found a presentation that he was going over, and he was going over what Bosch is, which is fun. Um, but uh, I have all sorts of things. I write books. I talk with large organizations about what they're doing. And, uh, you know, I have podcasts like my Software Defined Talk podcast. But nowadays, I pretty much do everything in my newsletter there, uh, if you're interested in that, because this is the age of newsletters. None of y'all seem to read blogs, and Twitter is imploding. And I try to use Mastodon, but, like, I don't know. Does anyone pay attention to that? It's, it's hard to tell. Uh, and, uh, you know, I could talk about that later. But let's get into platforms, because that's the point of what we're doing here. Now, what you may be asking is, like, isn't it good to know what you're talking about before you start talking about it and giving tips on how to do it? So let's jump right into it. Now, this is a diagram. Uh, you know, I try 
very hard not to give a vendor pitch. That's sort of like one of my roles at the company is I'm always brought in to not give a vendor pitch. And we'll see if I can achieve it even better than the previous two talks. Probably not. I think the first one was pretty not a vendor pitch until the end. And then the other one was also not a vendor pitch, kind of, sort of. But uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll have to rate myself here. So this is from the CNCF. I actually have no idea what this working group is doing. I did minimal research, but I really like this diagram. And this, I think, shows what is currently considered a platform, what I would call a platform, right? Uh, you know, notably, uh, you know, you've got your infrastructure at the bottom, you've got all this stuff in the middle. Again, think of our mayonnaise measuring frames. Well, not the mayonnaise measuring frames, but the people who are helping the mayonnaise measurers. It's all the stuff, the gooey stuff in the middle that developers would use, not only as their own middleware, but all that exciting secondary stuff, like identity management and storing stuff and uh, monitoring. I don't know if uh, this is actually orthodox observability or if it's just collecting logs and stuff, but people like to put that up there, whatever. And you know, all the things that are used to support those developers in there. And then of course on top, and this is something we'll return to uh, in a little while, what I think is fascinating nowadays is this top part, platform interfaces and the the docs and templates and API discoverability, that's been pulled into this idea of a platform. Now, you're probably looking at this and thinking, well, that looks like computers, uh, pretty much everything, which it is. That's more or less what we mean when we say a platform is all of the stuff right underneath moving pixels all around the screen. And so what I want to go over is, as the title says, over the past seven years or so, how, what are best practices we've learned from uh, running these platforms? You could call this, I don't know, culture or whatever. Uh, I always think that you know tools are equally important to culture despite what people up on stage just say. Like if you have culture with no tools, you just have a bunch of talking, uh, which is fun, but it doesn't actually do anything. So the tools are important, but uh, there's plenty more of that in the rest of the talks here. So we'll talk a little bit about the culture or uh, the meatware, if you will. So the first overriding principle uh, that we'll come back to comes uh, uh, from uh, someone I, I have the great pleasure of knowing and talking with every now and then, Thomas Mueller, over at Mercedes-Benz, who's, he's one of these people who's been, uh, uh, along with his team, it's not just him, one of these people who's been running a platform and owning the platform for seven, eight years or so. And the thing that he uh, kind of learned at the beginning and just said uh, several months ago, uh, you can read it here, but there's this focus on thinking about, again, think about our mayonnaise uh, developers. Why are we doing this? Who is this for? Well, this is for the developers, right? So the complete orientation we have is all about supporting developers out, right? Now, if you'll forgive me, let me just dip a little bit back into the mayonnaise and go over like, what is it a developer does? Now, I went over, they wake up early in the morning and they go observe things and experiment, but I wanna bring out especially like, if you think about this loop, because it becomes applicable to how uh, people start managing the platform, but I'm gonna give this context so that you can understand like what, what you're supporting, the phases there. And that is what I think of as a small batch loop. Also, it's a scientific method kind of applied to uh, uh, doing software. And that is, think of the mayonnaise people. Uh, they come up with a theory of what they should solve, how to solve it, right? They're developers, so they build uh, some stuff, they code it, they deploy it, hopefully to uh, production. They see people using it, they observe if it actually met their theory by measuring it. Uh, and then they see, using that feedback loop, they go through the loop over and over again until they improve that software and uh, they measure the mayonnaise appropriately, right? And this, you know, is the opposite of, of a waterfall approach that takes six or 12 months. You specify everything up front and deliver it. It has that feedback loop, that learning through it, right? So, so facilitating and supporting this loop becomes important for what a platform does, right? So you're supporting developers, they're your customers, you're supporting this loop uh, that they're going through and making it possible for them to do that. You'll notice when I went over the mayonnaise stuff, I didn't talk about, you know, and then they installed Kubernetes, right? Like that really wasn't part of, of what was going on uh, at all. So let's now go into how a platform helps someone and how when you are thinking about uh, running your platform and building it out and everything, what are the best practices you can use to support uh, our, our mayonnaise covered friends? Well, so let's dive into what a platform looks like, right? So. A platform notion has been around for a long time. I, I couldn't fit like, uh, you know, J J2EE and uh, Rails and uh, Corba and mainframes and all this other stuff on here. That's over past 2007. But a platform's existed for a long time, the notion of it. I used to develop on a platform. You'd call it an app server. It was very exciting. WebLogic, JBoss. I think we used WebSphere once. All those sorts of things. 
And, uh, and then, you know, eventually uh, Heroku came along, which is a great platform, right? If you have that notion in your head, it has the hallmarks of all platforms. It's super easy to use, it's, uh, it, it works, and everyone thinks it's way too expensive. These are things that you will encounter with platforms over and over again. Of course, no one really values their own time and how they spend it. it you know, that's not expensive. It's only expensive when you, the money leaves you, not when it comes to you. Uh, so, you know, and then uh, there was this era uh, that I mentioned in 2015 where there were a bunch of container orchestration, platform as a service people building things from 2015. And then somewhere in between there, uh, you know, we had this Kubernetes thing come around and we were like, hey, how about let's climb down the stack, never mind the platform stuff. And uh, let's reorient around this and uh, figure that all out. And now we're back in this era of, uh, if you've kind of seen all the chatter out there, of building these platforms back up, right, with, uh, with the kind of Kubernetes underneath it. Now you've got to build a platform on top of it for, for developers to make it useful. So this is a great time to reconsider what platforms are because many, many people are building it. It's probably the number one thing I talk about with people uh, is like, I, we're building out a platform thing, what do we do? I just talked with someone in a uh, US federal agency last week and it was delightful. It was fun talking with them. So this is a, a great definition that I think, um, I don't know, does most everyone use this? Probably. Uh, it's, it's from uh, Evan here at ThoughtWorks from 2018. Now, as a side note, being a, uh, uh, a VMware Tanzu uh, pivotal person, it always like grinds my gears when the ThoughtWorks people post something, because they always post something that we should have written. Uh, so maybe I should talk to my marketing friends and be like, hey, you, sh you should uh, make sure we write that. But this is a fantastic, I know you can't click on it now, but there'll be a link at the end and there's slides that you can get it. But this is a fantastic definition of what a platform is, right? And you can see it hits on uh, three, it hits on several things, but three very important things. One, and I'll be re-emphasizing this point over and over again because it's the mindset that I think is the most important thing to shift to. One is that the platform is for developers, application developers to be specific. Whenever I say developers, I mean application developers, not infrastructure developers, I guess, but our systems developers, definitely not embedded. I don't even know what that is. Uh, but it's for developers, right? So they are the users, the customers of it. And you can see that that's kind of woven in there, right? And then the second part that's very important, you can see it's in here, is that it's self-service, as, as we used to say back then. Hopefully we say that now too, because we definitely don't have enough of it. And in order to do that, the other side of self-service is that it's very automated, right? Like it doesn't require, uh, I don't know, a lot of manual things on anyone's. Whether you're operating the platform, it doesn't require it on your side or the developer side. And then the third thing, which I never really spend enough time talking about, because I probably talk with lots of large organizations, uh, who this is not so much a, uh, an interesting mind hack for uh, in the platform conversation, is that it's actually like good, a compelling internal product, right? It's something that you, you, know, you, uh, you often can sort of mandate people using things, but part of the platform think is that the developers using it should want to use it. It should be a compelling product, right? And that's also part of what makes it a product, right? Like a product that people don't want to use is generally not successful unless it's the only one out there, right? Or maybe the alternative is really expensive and uh, you don't want to buy it. But in thinking about a platform, those three things, and especially the last, right? Like what this gets to is, uh, to use a phrase that uh, is also used, is that you have a platform as a product, right? You're building a product you have customers that are the developers, and your focus, of course, focus of all computer stuff is it should work, right? A computer that doesn't work is not good, right? And so, of course, the platform needs to work, uh, but you can't get obsessed about just making it work, getting a blinking cursor going. That's fantastic. But it has to be something that's good that developers want to use, and I'll, we'll come back to this about what that means for it to be a product and how to ensure that it's actually good uh, and, and useful. So now, let, let's go back to this, right? And kind of look up a little bit more about uh, what's running on and running around in there, right? So like I said, you've got the infrastructure at the bottom, right? Whatever that may be. Uh, nowadays, it's popular to think uh, that, that it would be Kubernetes, right? That there's a, a fair amount of usage out there. Like, if you look at some of the, uh, you know, I'm always interested in this. If you look at the studies uh, from someone like a Gartner, who you know, it's fun to make fun of uh, analysts who you can't read their stuff because you don't want to pay thousands of dollars to read a six-page PDF. I used to be an analyst, so I understand, right? Uh, but they are a fantastic measure of what's going on in sort of like normal world, 
because that's who they talk with and that's who they survey, like all of the uh, normies, if you will. And when they look at the usage of Kubernetes, there's about, let's say, maybe 5%, maybe 8 or 10% of applications worldwide workloads, if you like that term, are running on Kubernetes, right? So while Kubernetes doesn't have the market share, it certainly has like the mind share, and it seems like we've all agreed that's what we're going to be doing. So that's often down there. Now there's other things, just sort of raw, raw -er infrastructure. There's uh, like the PASs from 2015 and beyond, like Cloud Foundry and things like that running there. But you've got infrastructure down there. And then in the middle, uh, there's a lot of time spent about what we've uh, seen uh, spoken about so far today. A lot of release management, configuration management, all that systems management stuff. But more and more of what you see in a platform, and I think what makes the platform effective is to think about it as a whole unit inside your organization. So it integrates together the middleware, the frameworks, the various services that you need, and increasingly, uh, as, as I'll get back to in a little bit, what it's also doing is kind of crawling up to be closer and closer to the developers. What is it a developer uses day to day? Whether it's the IDEs that they're using, the, uh, as, as I've come to think of it, the developer's intranet, like the, the sort of things that are custom to your organization, the portals, what is, that, what is that stuff in there? And a lot of that, the amalgamation of all that stuff, and maybe uh, I'll get to the idea of like, I'm not really sure if this infrastructure stuff at the bottom, I'm not really sure if one team can manage all of this, even two or three teams. So there's gotta be some separation of who's doing what here. But all of this stuff, uh, it comes to be what your platform is. And I think to make something explicit, usually in a largest organization, it's going to be, I keep using this phrase, your platform. It's going to be a platform that started off as stock, as normal, off the shelf, off the web, whatever, but you have probably customized it to a great degree to fit inside your organization. One of the Mercedes-Benz people, Roland, said that, you know, it's easy to learn how just like a generic uh, platform works, one that you might get, but there's all this stuff once you get inside Mercedes-Benz about how we use the platform and the services that come there, right? So you've got to think about how it fits into your organization. But the first thing that I think is important is, so how do your, uh, how do your like, uh, mayonnaise friends actually get their software onto this platform? Because I think what this platform is, like we keep reinventing it, which I think is great. It's, it's a good way to improve things. Uh, so that part is difficult, but I think the most difficult part starts to be how do we actually get stuff to it, right? Like how do we essentially deploy and release our software and configure it and package it. Over and over again becomes the most tedious thing. And as sort of tracers of that, what you can see, the, the way that I try to figure out, uh, I don't know, almost the first line, if you will, of usability of a platform is how frequently organizations are deploying to it, right? So what's the release cycle that you have? Because if you remember back to the developers, what they want is to have a feedback loop in place. And the way they're going to do that is they're going to deploy their software as frequently as possible. I always recommend a week. I don't know, two weeks is fine. If you're doing it with a month, you probably should do it in two weeks. But you definitely need to do it in a very fast cycle and figure out how to orient your entire process around that. Because if you get a week's worth of learning and feedback, you can do smaller amounts of work for sure. But if you think about all of the learning, or as people like to say, learnings that you have, right? Like you actually have the ability to improve things because you're gathering so much feedback and information as a developer. But when you look at lots of studies, uh, you can see that most organizations aren't really releasing their software that frequently, weekly, let alone even quarterly, if you can kind of squint there. Um, and this is a little bit of an old study, but there's newer ones that are basically uh, in that same area. And so most organizations, just think of all organizations, not just you know whatever cool ones y'all might work at, but all of them, if you bring them all into a, into a survey, you can see that they're not really that great at releasing frequently, which cuts down the ability of their developers, of their organization to learn and improve. And you know, there's a great symptom of that that you can track every year. This company keeps renaming itself uh, from version one. Uh, last I checked, they're called digital.ai, which is fun. Uh, but they've done a great survey called the uh, State of Agile. And you know, I, I, I like to track it. It's not like I sit down every week and track it. Every now and then I come and update this chart. But you can see when you track the usage of continuous delivery and continuous integration and, you know, never mind the nuance of those terms and all sorts of stuff, it's just a survey. But you can see that there's not that many people, there's a, well I shouldn't say not that many, there's a shocking amount of people over the years who haven't even automated their builds, right? Like, you're basically maintaining at 50 or 60 percent. 
And there's this other interesting thing that's happening is like the continuous delivery part is kind of like creeping up on the integration. And I, you know, I'm not really like an expert on CI CD, but I think CD is really hard to do if you don't have CI. And so at some point you're gonna reach the ceiling here where it's just not gonna work, right? So we've got this problem, and by we again, I mean us computer people, where we're not, we're kind of like, uh, we kind of tap out at actually automating things, which I think explains a lot of the urgency for the digital transformation uh, and things like that. So this gets us into what I, how, what I think is the start and the most important thing at, for a platform team, right? Or a platform strategy. And again, my, my orientation is why are you doing this? Who are the customers of it? And that's why I start with something like this rather than like, I don't know, what's your favorite way to model configuring your computers or, or, or whatever and, and make sure that they're remediated and you patch things, which is important. But again, that's like your car should probably have oil in it, right? Like to me, it's kind of like basics of, of what you need to do. But what I see, and this is a, a, you know, one of the practices, what I see most of the organizations I talk with who have a successful platform strategy, they start with this. They start with mapping out the complete end-to-end -end process. Some people call this a value stream, but then you get the capital L lean people coming to you and like wagging their finger at you. And you know, I live in Amsterdam, so I get enough finger wagging every day. I don't need more of it. Uh, and so, you know, you come in and you get the relevant people in the room and you you ask them, you kind of go through like, let's tell me everything that it takes to get uh, a release done, right? Like start from an idea, from, from the notion that we have, all the way to moving pixels on the screen to a user, a person, usually it's a person, using the software. And I don't know, only want to know the, um, the activities in the box. I'm very interested in those arrows. How long does it take to do the handoffs between them? And I don't want to know like the optimal thing. I want to know how long it takes uh, like if I'm going to do my stuff starting like November 30th. Right? When people are like, I gotta go to the Christmas market and I need to get my little blue vine cups and things like that. So this meeting, let's push it back into January, maybe mid-January, because you know, in my point being that you want a realistic, like how long it takes to schedule the meeting with the people to do the handoffs, like all of those sorts of things. Which, you know, you're gonna get a very optimistic take of this, but just knowing what those steps are and kind of uh, getting an idea of, of what it is allows you to kind of do a more realistic run by asking these two questions, which is the first one is what I've already gone over is how long does it take to deploy one line of code, right? And so what you're trying to do there is simplify down to like, never mind debating like what color the button should be, and what fonts it should look like, and like this, that, or the other. It's just like, we're just gonna put one line of code out, right? Like that maybe just what would one line of code do? We, we, whenever we're sorting ascending by descending, we have a new arrow that we want to put there. It's not even a line of code, we just want to deploy a PNG or an SVG or whatever the kids are doing nowadays, right? I should change that, just deploy an image. That would be much funner. Uh, and that's fine, that gives you like this first notion of what it is, but then the one that's really fun uh, is that you ask, I don't even want to change anything, I just want to run the release over again and do the deployment over. And, you know, as we were reminded today, like, that doesn't work uh, this morning, right? Like, there's always a lot of work that you find out goes into doing the same thing over again because, you know, you have to get some approvals here, you got to schedule this meeting there, like, all this stuff that doesn't actually have anything to do with the application. Or, you know, it turns out you try to deploy it again and it doesn't work, so there's all this other stuff that you did because, you know, you're not using some great... Uh, object oriented to take, uh, take or models or whatever to stuff where things just uh, work out well. Like back in the Corbett days, uh, it was great, the height of object orientation. So this is the thing that you want to start with as a platform team because it'll allow you to eventually realize that what you need to build, the thing that you're supporting, is this idea of, as people kind of misappropriate the term nowadays, getting to a golden path. Now that, again, there's so many phrases that I like to use. This one means something slightly different and, and less than what I'm going to here, but it's something people enjoy. You could say paved road uh, or, or something like that if you prefer. But what you're going for here is like, all right, so if I, if I look at everything going on here in the same way that the developers are trying to make the manage measures lives better, how can I, as, as infrastructure, as platform people, make the developers' lives better going through this process, right? And then what I want to do, in the same way that the, 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 uh, the developers are helping the mandates people uh, like measure things better, 
this is kind of uh, one sort of like process where you've got the actual tools in it. Obviously, you can't read it, which is fine. But you start to chart out in this fashion of what your pipeline is, what your golden path is, your value stream, you can call it whatever you want. But what is that What is that end-to-end -end process, and how do we start engineering and building up uh, that, that pipeline that eventually leads to, yes, like a runtime environment, a platform, but also helps the developers out with all that other stuff, right? Because it's not just building a platform, it's just not digitizing uh, your paper recipes. There's all this other stuff going on that, that uh, you need to help out with as well, to use a weird metaphor for it. Now, that's kind of the start uh, of, of what people start to do with a platform, and if you get this in place, what you've got here is uh, you've got the ability to kind of drive requirements, to drive what you're doing, to prioritize the work that you're doing, because you have uh, a fra another phrase people like to use, a North Star, or a Y driver, right? You've got a point to what you're doing, and you can start to say, all right, well, if that's the case, then we should build a pipeline first, and if that's the case, uh, we should make it very easy to deploy to some runtime environment. And if this is also the case, another thing developers struggle with is just like, getting a developer environment. Another thing they struggle with is like, we hire a new developer and it takes them two weeks to set up their laptop, right? So there's all these things that when you start paying attention to it, that those things become more and more of what a platform team pays attention to, more than just that runtime environment uh, at the bottom. So I alluded to recently, uh, as in about 15 minutes ago, uh, that one of the interesting things that's been going on in the platform space is paying attention further up the stack to the developer's intranet. And this started off, I don't know, maybe, you know, in, in earnest uh, a couple years ago. It kind of also came from all sorts of internal uh, development pla uh, portals, or as people call them. Which, by the way, uh, I don't know if you've had the chance to read internal developer portal or say it a lot, but that's a horrible phrase. Back when I was a Java developer, we had portals. And then there was this fun spec called portlets. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were not like life improving uh, for developers. And they were kind of hilarious. So every time I see the word portal, uh, I don't know. We, we had a domain name called portalpotty.com, uh, which uh, was where, as all great developers, we would kind of like vent our frustration about things. So, you know, the, uh, uh, as we like to say uh, back, back in the States, you know, the horses have left the barn or the cows or whatever. So we probably can't change from internal developer portal. But uh, hopefully every time you hear someone say that, you'll have a, uh, a, a little snicker to yourself about how exciting it is that we're saying portal. Uh, anyhow, IDP, people like to say, which uh, is similarly a strange word. Uh, but there's been this notion that, it, again, if you think about how are we going to help developers out, uh, probably what we should focus on is another issue developers always have, which is uh, finding each other, right? Think about being in a large organization like, uh, for example, a uh, big global bank like J.P. Morgan Chase, they have 20, 25,000 developers, right? And, you know, you're supposed to uh, reuse code and uh, do microservices. You don't want to have to develop things all on your own and work with each other. But, like, if, if you are, like, developing, I don't know, the uh, uh, just checking your balance, and you've got to go find three other teams that you're going to put into your new app, like, what do you do? Go to the intranet and that big search box where you also search for your holidays and type in ledger team, right? Like, like it's really hard to find these other developers and have a standardized way of finding the APIs that they are, the documentation. So there becomes this notion of the intranet that you have. And then also coming down from this, the more technical idea of a golden path is that idea going back to the developer with the laptop is... So when we have all these teams, these 20,000 developers, they all kind of sort of come up with their own way of configuring things, the way they configure middleware, the way that they set up their, their environments. So why don't we maybe try to help them standardize the way that they're doing that, come up with templates and default configurations, opinions, if you will, of how they go about doing that stuff. And rather than having just the, uh, the enterprise architects or uh, some other group do that, we should make that part of the platform, right? Integrate it into the runtime environment, integrate it into the tools that we have, and kind of aware of each other and always building up this platform that we have that we actually maintain beyond just like infrastructure, right? Like, because if you're just providing infrastructure, uh, you know, you're leaving it to the developers to figure out all this other stuff on top of it, right? Or you're leaving it to, as, as I think people still call them, the uh, the DevOps engineers, the people who maintain Jenkins for you and, and all of these tools, to kind of also figure out how to do something and kind of force uh, the developers to actually use that. 
But the notion that I, and I see this, is that people bring that stuff into the platform, right? So they start to combine together the infrastructure you're deploying it on, the developer tools that you have, the configuration that you're going to have, all of this sort of stuff into the same notion of a product of a platform targeted at developers. Now, the runtime environment, which is the focus that we've had uh, for, for quite some time, right, uh, over the past, I don't know, four or five years. Now, you know, you might remember a time when Kubernetes wasn't the thing we were all going to do. Uh, and there were lots of different uh, notions and things out there. And really, like, I think, I think what at least I finally learned, and hopefully at some point we can learn, is like the runtime environment, like, who cares? It's a strange thing for someone at VMware to talk about, I guess. But like, I don't know, things are going to come and go. You're going to run things in containers, or I don't know what happened to unikernels, and like, or VMs, or like bare metal, whatever that is. Like, all of that stuff is thrilling and fun. But like, if you pay too much attention to it, and you get too obsessed about it, uh, you're really just going to, as, as a team doing infrastructure, all you're ever going to do is this, right? Like, you're going to set up a runtime environment, and then you're going to be like, now I'm done. And then your application developers are going to come, and they're going to be like, and, right? Like, well, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do with this. I already had this, right? All you're going to have is like a blinking cursor that is just waiting to be useful, right? So really, like, getting the runtime environment in place is important, but it's not like, you know, all of the work, right? You got to kind of like dig down. Uh, well, I guess you don't dig up unless you're buried, like in that, that movie about the kung fu people. But like, you know, you've got to kind of crawl up more to the application developers. And again, that's why you think about all the stuff that's in a platform and how it integrates and kind of subsumes just the blinking cursor. So, so, let's talk about two more things. First, uh, what's the general like plan, uh, the, the activities that people actually do when they're putting a platform in place, right? So we've got a foggy notion uh, of what a platform is, that stack of everything that your developers use kind of down to the infrastructure, the middleware, the configuration, what we're playing around with now is the developer's intranet, the, uh, the aforementioned portal uh, that they'll, they'll be using, how they discover things and uh, kind of their, their project pages. I often think of the internal development portal thing as the post-Atlassian age, right? Because I feel like Atlassian is supposed to have been doing all of that, and all of a sudden we have this new notion in a bunch of startups. And I know Atlassian has a product that does that, uh, that I came across once, but like, I mean, I mean hopefully they, uh, I should go check their marketing and see if they're licensing Gartner stuff on internal developer pl uh, portals. See, I can't even say it, internal developer platforms, portals, portal. Uh, anyhow, this is, this is a, a, a two-phase sort of um, plan, a strategy, if you will, if you like the loose meaning of that term, that I've seen many organizations go through over and over again when they put a platform in place. So the first thing you do is you form a platform team, which very importantly has an owner or a product manager, actual platform engineers, people who work it and customize it, people who operate it, but they also have a role that I'll come back in a little bit, the advocates, or uh, as we used to say, evangelists, whatever it may be. Then you tend to limit yourselves uh, to just picking one application. So you go find one application out that's important, that also like is a little less risky than other ones, and then uh, you found your application, and then what you do is basically you get to know your customer, the developers working on that application. Uh, I'll go over a little bit like one thing you can do. You can do a developer toil aud audit. You just send out a survey that is a bunch of questions that ask them like, what's terrible, right? Like that helps you discover how you can help developers out. And then you do that end-to-end -end analysis that I was going over. You start integrating and building your platform out, hopefully with a, a pre-integrated one, because at point five here, uh, if you're going to build your own platform, that's probably going to take a year or so and cost several millions of dollars, but it's fun uh, if, if you want to do that. Uh, and then you're going to build out that golden path to production, again with your developers going through that small batch loop. And uh, you could also have a portal uh, that you add on top of that if that is prioritized as something that helps your developers out. You do that for three months, right? And the goal after three months is that you've shipped that application into production several times and you have like a minimal viable uh, platform, right? And you, the most important thing is that you've actually learned what it takes to have a platform in place, right? Like you've gone through actually deploying to production and doing things and you know what it, what it looks like uh, and uh, you put those learnings back into the loop. And then essentially the growth phase after that is to sort of do this thing over again but to start to do it with more and more applications, right? And the key there is to think about how do we take people from those original teams and seed them into other teams so that they uh, are essentially uh, 
marketing, but also instructing other teams about how to go about doing things, right? And this is a key part uh, to what I see large organizations doing, is they pick individuals who would be kind of prone to do this sort of thing, and they move them out to other teams who are starting to do it, right? And that's the way that you start getting training and building up trust in the platform, and keep that feedback loop going. And you just keep building and building this platform out, always focusing on the, uh, the people that you're trying to help out. So, just to emphasize the point again, I'm just going to go through a, a couple of best practices. Uh, first of all, always remember that the developers are your customers, the application developers. And this really means product managing what you're doing, right? Which is not something that a lot of uh, infrastructure and operations people do. So it's worth a little bit thinking about what product management is. And there's a whole lot of stuff that product managers do. But the key thing that they focus on is thinking about what would be the best feature for us to get into our product right now, right? And the best feature comes with an understanding of who the customers are, an understanding of not only if it's a viable uh, thing, but if it actually is valuable, right? <coughs> Can we actually get this feature into production? Will it help people out? And so they're the ones who prioritize what it is you're doing by understanding the customers and what they're doing. Now again, you can read a lot more about what product managers do. They have their own language and their own conferences. They're generally very nice, uh, like gentle people who are all out there to help you out with, with things. They love, as we all do, talking about what they do and kind of getting input on it. But the main thing is get a product manager. And if, if uh, you know, that's pretty much it. Find yourself a product manager and start applying product management to what you're doing. Now next, you're going to end up doing a lot of platform marketing. And I always like to go over this because you're going to do a lot more marketing than you anticipate. You don't just set up an email list or set up a release notes. You're actually, for example, going to have branding around what you do as you can see here. You might even have, well, I shouldn't say might, what I encourage people to do, especially in large organizations, is to start having a quarterly internal conference where your platform team goes over what they do. Those initial development teams present about what they've been doing. It's educational, but it's also trust building and scaling up that platform, right? Like, <clears throat> I work at a vendor. We understand the importance of marketing to get people using your stuff. Uh, and so that's another thing that these organizations do all the time. <clears throat> then you have uh, the advocates that I mentioned. This is part of the marketing function, but if you've seen what us uh, developer advocates and other people go out and do, this is a role, often its own team, uh, that, that people focus on uh, quite a bit. Uh, you know, someone, for example, at J.P. Morgan Chase, they have a team of about eight people. And all they do is they kind of go out, talk with people, explain what's going on. But key to what they do is gather feedback as well. And then, uh, finally, uh, the last thing that I'll go over is that there's this kind of shift that you have with operations people. That one of my friends who uh, did this platform stuff at uh, UBS, big, big bank, went over. And you can see that as you start to think about what's different when you're delivering a product, right? Like, you reorient as an infrastructure and operations people what you want to do based on the product thinking and making the customers' lives better, right? And you can see how that, there's this subtle but very important shift from back when I won that award that you're not responsible for delivering a service to spec. You're not just responsible for keeping it up, but you're responsible for, uh, to pardon another phrase, the outcome that you have, how people are using it and if they're achieving that goal of not only deploying their software, but making sure that the, uh, the mayonnaise is being measured uh, appropriately. So that's all that we have time for there. there there's all sorts of more explanation uh, uh, and even more tips and best practices uh, if you're interested in. That will take you to a link where I catalog all the, uh, the platform stuff. Like I said, I put most everything in, in the newsletter that I have now. I'll be around uh, for, for uh, most of the rest of the day. And uh, if you're interested in talking more, I'm, I'm always uh, interested in hearing what people are up to. And uh, I'm generally pretty easy to get a hold of. Thanks.